Welcome to the Kansas City Woodworkers Guild Skills Builder. Welcome everybody to the May 2022 Skill Builder. I'm Kevin Thomas, the Director of Training, and joining us today to share his uh, knowledge that he's learned from doing a lot of uh, drawers with half-blind dovetails is uh, John Sloss. I'm going to turn it over to you, John. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's a beautiful day. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I guess we should all be home doing yard work rather than this, but, but this, this, is a lot, this is a lot more fun. Oh, that, now you're making us feel bad, Leon. Um, <clears throat> as Kevin said, we're just going to be talking about half-blind dovetails today through the use of the, uh, the Lee jig. This is one of the later generation Lee jigs. Uh, this was donated by David Blyer, who was a previous member and a uh, retired cabinet maker. And uh, he, one of, the, one of the first things he did when he joined was walked in the door carrying this jig uh, with the, the base it's on and, and said, here, it's yours, I'm done with it. <laughs> but it's a great tool. And uh, I'm glad to see that there's interest in it. Uh, as Kevin said, I've, I'm not an expert in the use of the jig, but I have a fair amount of experience. Over the last three years, I've done 20 drawers uh, on two projects. I made a couple dressers that involve 16 drawers in total. This is one of the smallest ones. And uh, you can see what we're going to be trying to accomplish today is, is a, a version of a half-blind dovetail. Half-blind referencing the fact that, surprise, surprise, you can't see them from the front, but you can from the side. In the back, I cheated and used a, a locking rabbit joint uh, as opposed to through dovetails. And I don't mean cheated, but uh, I didn't feel that since that drawer is never going to be exposed in that aspect, then what the heck. So I would bang, bang those out on the router table with a, with a uh, locking rabbit um, bit. Uh, the joint consists of, for those of you who haven't seen, the tails and pins separated. The joint consists of a tail board and that's very typical, and a pin board. Uh, the tail board consists of the tails, obviously, and in Lee terminology, the spaces between the tails is referred to as the pin sockets. And correspondingly, the pin board consists of the pins as well as the tail sockets. And when they go together, you have a joint that fits like that. And you'll note that on this test joint that I did in preparation for this session, I wrote down uh, the dimensions that we'll talk about in the, in the uh, setup of the, of the jig, so that one of the beauties of the Lee system is that it's repeatable. You can recreate the joint by dialing in the same uh, measurements on the scales and same what's called cutter projection on the router so that, hey, guess what? I, I did this other set six months ago or six years ago and I set up the jig the same way as I did then and boom, you, you've got it. But the, uh, the jig I, th I feel, and the reason I've used it, is I'm certainly not an expert like a Wayne Peterson or whoever in cutting uh, hand-cut dovetails. But uh, nonetheless, it does give you a consistent quality, a good quality joint, um, very productively. 
you know, I, I, I can't even imagine cutting dovetails for 20 drawers by hand. Yeah. And uh, so one of the first things we're going to do today is actually, since this is set up ready to rock and roll, I'm going to actually cut a joint. And what I forgot is, uh, George, would you go by, go in there, um, you know, that bottom cabinet and grab some hearing protection for those that should choose to take advantage of it? Um, so that's the joint. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow the outline that I've prepared here, and that's why I'll refer to this box, which has a, a copy of that outline in it. Uh, the tails are cut in the side of the drawer, if you will. And the pins are cut in the front. And the the tails are cut with the tail board in vertical position, clamped in what's called the front clamp here. And the tail board is clamped using the rear clamp in a horizontal position. And to accomplish that, they have cleverly designed the finger assembly and the fingers to allow adjustable and course and consequently pretty darn good fit by orienting the the finger assembly this way these are the the finger these are the guide fingers for cutting tails and these are the guide fingers for cutting pins. So after I have the board cut vertically for the tails, if I rotate this 180 degrees, reinstall it on the machine with the pin board in place, then I'm able to route the pin boards with the, uh, with the same setup. I'm not adjusting anything. Uh, once I have the, the uh, the finger assembly dialed into the dimension I want, I can cut the tails and the pins with one setting. The, uh, when you do set the scales, and uh, Chris, can I get an overhead view? Sure. When you set the scales, and one of the advantages of the newer generation Lee jig is the enhancement of the scales. Previously, the, the scales were just uh, stamped out of this pot metal here. And as you can see, they're now uh, much more, I guess you'd say, resolute and easier to read than they were previously with with this setup. This is from the, uh, I think it's a 2754 or some number jig like that. And this one's called the D4R. And I would, I would recommend since they're both, these are both uh, stored in the storeroom, just the, in the office, the, the actual, uh, actually they're in the training room, this side of the uh, office. And uh, so you can select either either jig that you want to use, but I would recommend using the D4R. Uh, the the jig is, or the uh, the scales are much more legible and easy to adjust. To um, what I started to say is that whether you're cutting the pins or the tails, you're always going to set your scale on the tail thickness. Uh, regardless of whether you're cutting pins or tails, there is no uh, there is no variance between the thickness you're setting the scales on when you're cutting the pins or in the tails. You always set it on the pin, the tail thickness. 
And uh, another always is the fact that the inside of the, of the board you're cutting, whether it's tailboard or pinboard, is always facing away from the jig. So you're, it's gonna be facing up or facing out. So it's always a good idea to use some kind of symbology in uh, reference to that inside surface because typically, you know, you want to make sure that, oh boy, that was supposed to be the front of my drawer <laughs> and now it's the, shoot, now it's the inside of the drawer. That would be a bummer. So uh, yeah, whether it's a eye for inside or in Lee's uh, symbology, they use a, no, we don't have an easel here, but uh, they use a, uh, a square with a with a, dime, a a triangle inside, and when they're referencing the outside, as you read through the manual, they they have a square with a, with the triangle outside of the outside of the square. So something of that nature is highly recommended. Okay, so in your handout uh, number two references the things you'll probably need. Um, first is the user guide which I have in my possession here. And it's kind of an intimidating book, but guess what? Uh, you don't need to read the whole thing. All you need to do is focus on the kind of dovetails you want to cut. It, it references sliding dovetails and end-to-end uh, -end joinery for dovetails. Uh, it references uh, through dovetails, of course, which we're not going to cover today. Um, and then, of course, half-blind half dovetails as well. And then there's some hints and tricks in the back. But uh, as begrudgingly as we all approach user guides like this, it's, uh, it's kind of necessary to read the darn thing. So um, as opposed to watching television one evening, about three years ago, I, I, I read that thing uh, cover to cover, so to speak, and... Uh, and then when I came back two and a half years later and tried to do it again, guess what? I read it again because it just uh, is not a not something that is like riding a bicycle. You need to take uh, take the time to to acquaint yourself with it. Uh, the back side of the sheet, when we get into that part of the program, um, really distills about seventy five pages of the of the guide, well actually both sides because there is a section on safety and equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But this one sheet of paper really distills about 75 pages of the, of the 150 page guide. So um, I think, I hope you find it useful if you do use the, uh, use the tool going forward. But this is, this is the guidance that we'll, we'll use as we go through the setup process in just a bit. Um, the jig on a base, uh, this is the base that, that David built for the jig, um, and this is simply screw attached to the base, and the base accomplishes a couple things. One, it gets it, gets it to a, a, a very comfortable ergonomic working height, and it also allows for longer, bigger drawers, because if you think about it, when you're cutting the the tails or the sides of the drawers on the uh, uh, in the vertical orientation, uh, you either need to cut a hole in the floor or or raise the machine one or the other. And uh, so, this is going to be about as uh, long a drawer as I'm going to make. Uh, with with this with this jig, I was able to do a 36 inch drawer, and so you had a board that long. Uh, clamped in the jig, so keep that in mind. Uh, I think I think you'd find it a little bit uncomfortable to be working with the jig down at uh, tabletop height. The other thing that, as I mentioned, clamping a longer vertical piece. I don't think that I had captured this in the uh, the notes here, but if you know, you're probably related to that 36 inch wide drawer you're probably going or deep drawer you're probably going to have a front that's uh, of pretty close to equal width you don't want that 
board out here, levering the jig to the point of what we term racking the jig because it will not squ stay square if you have a, a five pound board out here pulling down on it. So all I'm saying is if you do encounter that circumstance and build yourself some kind of a, a, uh, a jack to hold your board in uh, perfectly level orientation without um, putting undue strain on the, on the jig. The thing is uh, that you need to keep it as, as square and everything is level and flat and uh, in, in com perfect contact with your workpiece as possible. The finger joints need to lay flat on the, on the uh, pin board when you're cutting it and on the edge of the tail boards when you're cutting that as well. If there's any gap, you know, which could be caused, but you know, if, if you did, if you had some leverage back there and, and the machine did rack or the jig did rack at all, it could create uh, a gap between your finger assembly and your workpiece. And if that happens, you're going to go, what the heck is going on until you notice, oh shoot, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, like a lot of things. If, you, if you're trying to get that blade straight in the table saw, you, you don't want to see a light leak through there. If you can see a light leak at all between your finger assembly and your workpiece, uh, you got a problem and it's not, it's not going to, it's not going to give you a good joint. So make, make sure everything's tight that way. Okay, with that, believe it or not, I'm going to cut a, uh, a tail test board, and then we're going to change it over and cut the pin board. And I, I'll, I'll do that just to, uh, so you don't have to listen to me talk without any action, if you will. And as such, uh, I won't be talking a lot while I do that. Let's just go through it and see how long it takes. And it kind of gives you a sense for the, I guess you'd say, the level of productivity of the machine. It, uh, I only have, uh, I'm cutting uh, three tails on this five and a half inch wide test board. Um, and we'll finish, uh, we'll, we'll get to that once I finish going through this list of things you'll need. Uh, a caliper <coughs> is a good idea. Uh, this is right out of the cabinet in there. I have my own, but uh, I try to assemble the tools here that you can use that are all available through the guild. And this would allow you to measure, again, the cutter projection, and that would be from the tip of the cutter to the base of the router, the bottom of the router. And that's critical as we'll learn as we go through the process today. Um, so that's a tool that I would highly recommend having at your disposal. It's not referenced specifically in the, in the manual, but I found it to be the best tool to, to measure the, that, that cutter depth. Not the cutter depth, but the, the cutter projection. Cutter depth would be the, the depth of the cut into the wood, as opposed to the cutter projection, which uh, is the depth of cut into the wood, inclusive of the, the guide bush, which is, this is the guide bush, this, this uh, I don't know whether you can see that here or not, but the guide bush rides on the edges of the guide fingers that, are, that, are, that comprise the guide assembly, or excuse me, the finger assembly. Uh, it's what I'm pointing at right there, that, br that brass guide bush, which happens to be 7 16 diameter. And I'll probably repeat myself many times today, but 7 16 16 inch guide bush is the only diameter that you're going to use for cutting half, half blind dovetails. Uh, there, is, there are other dimensions, including 5 8 there's a 5 eighths guide bush right there. 
and this would uh, replace the 7 sixteenths I have on the router now. And I don't know whether you're all familiar with the use of, of bush, bushings like this, but uh, this goes up from the bottom and then this screws up, screws onto the top through on the back side of the, the router base. But uh, 7 sixteenths is the owner only router guide bush diameter that you're going to use. And that, that number is referring not to the depth of it or anything, but it's referring to the outside, the OD, outside diameter. And then uh, you'll need a, the Lee screwdriver, which is this tool right here, square drive. And it's what fits into the, the locking screws on each of the, the guide fingers. Then the uh, bridge extrusion, which is referred to. Uh, let's see. Can you look at that, Chris, straight down on, on these guys? These fingers, you can see the, see the, uh, the black plastic portion there. That's called bridge extrusion. So that when you adjust for the pattern of pins and tails you want, if you have a gap between this, we're gonna cut a tail right there, okay? And if you have a gap of more than an eighth of an inch between the two halves of your, your tail guide here, then you're gonna to wanna to use this extrusion so that as you're routing around this perimeter, your router is not gonna fall into the gap between the two halves of the guide finger, okay? And you do that by cutting with a coping saw or I've used the radial arm saw with a little hold down device, you know, keeping my fingers well away from the blade, obviously. But if you just try to do it without holding it down, you're gonna have these things ping, 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 flying all over the place. But uh, yeah, cut them slightly shorter than the distance between the shoulder of each of the guide fingers, and then they just, they just shove in there. I'm gonna pull this one out. And there's, there's a piece, and it just press fits right in there very, very simply. Anyway, but that's a tool you're more than likely going to need. And again, these are, these are part of the, the whole ensemble here we have uh, available to you with, the, with this jig. Uh, and then practice boards, got a, an array of practice boards here. Spacer board, which is We'll use that when we go through this step by step, but this spacer board is, happens to be six by 23 by three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, but you, we put that in there before we put the uh, finger assembly on the jig to just keep everything level. Otherwise, you know, you're gonna get that racking going on again where you have, hmm, I got a gap here, but I'm, I'm down here, but well, that's because the whole assembly is not level and you, you can accomplish that with the use of the spacer board to, at the start of your setup. So we'll use that as well. And then finally, if you get, uh, if you need a little a joint that needs a little coaxing, uh, a mallet in a box, a, a mallet in a block I meant to say, which I think I had put one in here, maybe not. Nope. I thought I had everything out, but anyway, we may not need it anyway. And if we do, we'll just grab one of these boards and do a little coaxing with that. Okay, with that said, um, if you want hearing protection, I would advise donning it at this point. Typically, I would put on the respirator, but I'm gonna brave it this afternoon because I'm not gonna be cutting a whole lot of joints and uh, it's kind of hard to talk through the thing. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to proceed without that at this juncture, but I will use my, my uh, earmuffs to get the job done. And as I say, uh, I'm not trying to keep anything a secret, but as I go through this, I'm not going to talk a whole lot. We'll just do this, and I think we're probably talking 10 minutes or so 
to cut uh, the tails and transition to the pins and get those cut. And let's see if we have a, a joint that goes together as a result of that activity. And I'll try to do a lot of that. I'm sure I'll talk somewhat, but not a lot. So here we go. Okay, they don't look too shabby. John? Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, dovetail bit are you using? Big question. What kind of Kevin dovetail asked, bit are you using? What I have in the machine is called a, uh, a number 120 bit, which is half inch diameter, half inch cutting depth, and 14 degree uh, angle on the bit. And we'll talk about that uh, in terms of the array of bits we have and, and the array of bits you can use for half tail, half, half blind dovetails in just a bit. So this is a, a backing board that you use to prevent tear out or blow out on the back of your of your pins, or excuse me, your tails. And let's see, keep an eye on that, Joe. Don't let me grab the wrong one when we <laughs> That's the, the danger of having a whole bunch of different when, when, when I go through the test process and uh, There's the one I was looking for, you know, and I have generation one and two and three. I, I go to that radial arm saw real quick and cut off the old ones before I start the new ones. So, well, wait a minute, which one am I working on here? Okay. So now we're moving on to the pin board. 
And I'm going to grab another, let's see. We'll use this guy. We'll have a very funky looking, what is this, hackberry or ash? Who knows? This is scrap that was in the training room. So I'm going to flip over the, and we're going to get into a whole lot more detail when we actually get into the, the setup, as, as in we're starting from scratch. But I cheated for this exercise. I, I'm not starting from scratch. I'm actually obviously using the experience I have with cutting the test boards that we did before. So now... I know from the test boards I showed you a minute ago, and I'm going to refer to it here, the pin board I had at a setting of 13 sixteenths plus a smidge, or maybe a half a smidge, I don't remember. Let's see, 13 sixteenths. And we'll talk about why it's necessary. Gee, I thought you were always, you said you always set the, the pin and the tail boards at the same thickness, and that being the tail board thickness. But the reason that it was necessary to change that as I went through the test process before to accomplish this fit uh, is that I found that the the tails were proud of the pins by too much. So in order to cor correct that, I had to cut the pins deeper than I had in the previous test uh, generation. Meaning that uh, instead of being on three quarters, which is 12 sixteenths of an inch, I went to 13 sixteenths of an inch plus a little bit and that flushed them up pretty darn good. So with that knowledge, I was able to start by setting this at, at that setting. Okay, so now I'm gonna lower my finger assembly again. And oh, by the way, I have a, again, to keep things level, you know, always try to maintain that flatness and, and level situation. I'm kind of pressing down on these fingers as I snug up that knob, same thing over here. And I have a, I have a spacer board over here, see? So that my, my finger assembly doesn't go, oh shoot, you know, we've got to, you know, to avoid that gap that we talked about a minute ago. So I have this spacer board over here. Of the, obviously critical would be to have it of the same thickness as as your actual workpiece. Okay, and I had clamped a stop board in the vertical clamp up here, and that's what my pin board is banging into. So that's oriented, orienting it correctly uh, laterally this way. And to orient it correctly vertically, all I need to do is have the finger assembly laying flat on top of it. So, Another thing you'll see in the notes that I'll refer to numerous times is when I do make changes like that, I came up with, for, for my own sake, <clears throat> the reference to four pair, kind of like playing poker or something. And four pair is talking about, there's four pairs of adjustments I want to check every time before I turn the darn thing on, because don't ask me how I know this, but if you don't check them all, you might have forgotten to tighten something down. So the four pair are these two speed clamps here, and they should always be facing towards the rear, okay? The two speed clamps in the front should always be facing down, or point, pointing down, not facing, 
Um, then you have the finger assembly thumb screws here. So that's pair number one, pair number two, thumb screws are pair number three. And finally, the locking knobs for holding down the, the finger assembly is, is pair number four, okay? So I always go, mm-hmm, 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 before I turn on the machine. And then I don't go, crap. The other thing I'll mention, which, no, I'm not going to mention that. I will at a later point because it is it's critical, but it's it's kind of out of sequence in terms of the, in terms of our learning experience here. Okay, now I'm going to cut the pins. Nailed it. Maybe. Naturally. Maybe. Okay. Moment of truth. Raise my finger assembly. And when I say raise it, once you're in the process like this, whether you're testing or actually doing your, your live project, work pieces, um, when you raise it sixteenth of an inch, eighth of an inch, something like that, what you don't want in, in this, this is all in the notes, um, you don't want to yank this up three quarters of an inch with this one still locked down or even if it's loosened that would be a problem because you're going to damage something if you do that. This thing is, is not a super precise, mach precisely machined device, but uh, it's designed to raise and lower both sides simultaneously. So if I cheat and raise this side a sixteenth of an inch and then this side a sixteenth of an inch, that's not a problem. But if you try to do a whole bunch, you know, I'm going to pull it out. Well, I'll start on this end. You've just busted something, I guarantee it. So make sure you do it so that they come up together to the best of your ability. <laughs> Look at there. Look at there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. First time you did that, how many practice boards did you go through? You know, this, this time, Gary, seriously, um, I, uh, 
I think I'm getting the hang of this because it only I mean, took the very first time. Oh, the first time. Just oh hell, I was here for two days. Yeah, that's what I, <laughs> <laughs> I should I shouldn't discourage you by saying. <laughs> Come on. Somebody take that apart. Ace can do that. And then John, why, don't you you, why don't you pass that around after you? When you did 16 drawers. Microphone, please. When you did 16 drawers, did you cut all of the tails at once and then all of the pins for all of the drawers since you had it set up? Just go ahead and pass it around. Um, yeah, I did. I, I cut uh, all of the tails and then all, the, all of the pins, yeah. I mean, for each size. Actually, uh, of the yeah, 16, right. 16 drawers, there there were there were four different size drawers. You know, little guys, medium size, and then the next level was a little bit wider, too wide, and then there was three monster drawers under underneath that. So, for each size, I did all of the pins, or all of the tails, and then all of the pins. Yeah. But you made sure they all fit before you started making all of them. No, I just went ahead and cut them and. <laughs> Hope for the best. hope for the best. Don't be a don't be a wise guy, John. No, I just uh, make sure they fit before you before you get into the real thing. Um, so let's continue on our outline, and then we're gonna then we're gonna get to the the detail on the back shortly. But uh, under safety trip uh, safety tips number three. Um, Read the user guide. There's there's good safety information in there, plus uh, you know an infinite amount of operational detail that you need to uh, become familiar with. Um, you noted B under number three. Don't route at face level. Um, for a couple of reasons, and what, what I'm saying is. You don't need to be down like like, like you're driving a, a race car down here and trying to keep out of the wind or whatever. Uh, pretty dangerous because a whole lot of stuff is coming coming at you when you do that. And as as indicated also under that item, <clears throat> you want to keep the machine. This is the comment I was going to make a minute ago, but I opted not to. You want to keep your router ori oriented. Um, consistently. And I'm going to call this knob here the 12 o'clock position. What it actually suggests in the manual is that you, you make a mark on your router base at the 12 o'clock position. Well, if, if you have a, a device on the router that corresponds to where you would have put your mark, use it. And that's what I'm, I'm doing. And what I'm saying, I want to say here, is, is if you're up here, you can keep track of where your router is orientation-wise. And I'm sure I'm not perfect in this regard, but what you don't want to do as you're routing is go like this, and I'm rounding corners, and watch, see my 12 o'clock orientation there? It keeps changing. You ain't going to get a good joint if you, if you do that, because as, as best as they try to keep the bit and the guide bush concentric, they're not. If, and they're, if they're off at all, you're going, you're going to magnify that problem as you go back and forth like that. So you, know, you, don't, you don't want to be coming at, at your routing, you know, I'm going to turn that corner like this. You want to, you know, come in and out as straight as 12 o'clock allows you to do, okay? So there is a bit that, that Lee provides. It's called an eccentric bit that actually um, compensates for the, in fact I have it, but it's, it's locked in that case and I wasn't gonna admit this to you but I forgot my key <laughs> in my toolbox today. That's why we're not using a nicer, <laughs> a nicer caliber than we are. My, my wife took the dog to the dog. I said, can you run me down a key that I left hanging on the wall in the kitchen? And she said, I'm at the dog park, can't do it for you. So anyway, so the, uh, the adjustable eccentric guide bush that can be used on here to compensate for lack of 
con concentricity. Um, I don't find necessary very, I, I own one, but I, I, I haven't had to use it. Um, I, I wanted to u not use it so that what you have available to you uh, is all you need in order to accomplish your dovetails. But uh, that's another thing too. Uh, I mean, you can be out of concentricity, but as long as you maintain that 12 o'clock orientation, guess what? It doesn't matter. Yeah, because you're 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 keeping it. You know, if it, if if that if that rudder if that cutter is off in the left in the guide bush, just make sure it always stays oriented that way, off to the left or off to the right or whatever the heck it's doing. As long as it's consistent, as long as you're consistent in how you cut it, then you won't need that uh, adjustable guide bush. <clears throat> and speaking of the guide bush, number uh, C says always use a guide bush. You'd never, never try to do this in the jig or cutting any dovetails with a, with a router without, with a, without the use of the guide bush. The other thing is you'll note that with, uh, are these, no, that's, it doesn't matter whether these are the boards we just cut or not, but you know, end grain, end grain. You're never gonna do side grain or, or edge grain, I should say, like that. Now we are when we cut the when we cut the tails, we were cutting side grain like this. But the the yeah. finished product is end grain, end grain to end grain. When you're cutting the the pins, then you're actually diving into to the end grain itself. No plywood, it says. Yeah, I wouldn't use plywood for dovetail joints. Um, 3E, wax the router base or guide fingers for smooth operation when in contact with the finger assembly. It can get a little herky-jerky. Oh, man, that thing just is not moving smoothly. Grab a stick of paraffin or some Johnson wax, whatever, whatever your preference is. You can polish the bottom of the uh, router base with Johnson Wax. I, I just like to take this, I just take the paraffin and go stripe, stripe, stripe right on the, right on the fingers themselves. And it helps a lot. Keeps them moving very smoothly. And, it, you know, I put that under safety because it could be a safety factor if you know, it comes to a herky-jerky stop because it's not moving smoothly. Always wear safety glasses with side shields, hearing protection, and a dusk mask. Who was that mask man? Uh, or respirator when using the lead jig. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cut a whole bunch of joints without those tools and, or safety devices in, available to me. <clears throat> Touch check all four pair that we talked about before. Um, touch check is, you know, this, as opposed to just glancing at them. Can't really tell unless, especially with the thumb screws, unless you're actually, thumb screws and the locking knobs on the, on the finger assembly, unless you actually adjust them or touch them and see if they're tight. And then finally, uh, as I try to do consistently, uh, do not remove the router from the jig until it's come to a complete stop, turned off and come to a complete stop. Pull the router straight out horizontally. Do not raise or lower the router until it is clear of the jig. So um, as long as you have the, the only thing that can contact the finger assembly or the fingers is the guide bush, then you're fine. But if you try to go, well, I'm done and the thing's still spinning on me, and I pull it out like this, chances are one of these times you're gonna catch that router, that cutter on one of these fingers and it's gonna rick, this thing is gonna ricochet like crazy off those, and not, not to mention damage the, uh, the guide fingers. So uh, I consistently, I'm not great about a lot of things uh, in terms of, <clears throat> well, we all, we all have our shortcomings safety wise, but 
Um, I do let it come to a complete stop before I do anything with this darn, with this thing after, after since since it needs to be pulled out of contact with a metal object like that, or even if even if it was a, a, a uh, just a piece of wood, I'd still want to make sure it had completely stopped revolving before I pulled it free. Joe, John, you got. You cut three pins, I mean three tails here, Uh huh. but up on your jig you've got one, two, three, at least five or six of them. Is there a reason to have those extra ones out there? Uh, good question. Uh, no. This first one we'll talk about in a minute, and, and I don't know whether you can see that or not. Yeah, the one yeah. I, I have my finger on there, that's strictly for a router support. Okay. Uh, and, and that you have on both ends. Don't really need it over here unless you were cutting. If you were cutting asymmetric drawers, let's say you wanted the t the front of the drawer to be taller than the sides of the drawer, which is oftentimes the case, then you're going to be cutting asymmetric uh, asymmetric uh, which would it be asymmetric uh, pins. Okay, and you're going to do then you do the left hand sides of the drawer uh, on the left. On the left side of the uh, left side of the jig, and then you'd come. Over. You do all those <clears throat> per the question earlier. Do you do all the all the all the tails and then all the pins? Yes. In in the case of asymmetric joints, you do um, all the, all of your left hand ones over here, and then you come over here and do all your right hand ones. Because, <coughs> and, and let's say your your tops were taller than when you're. Uh, let's see. When you stand them up, they'd be a mirror image of each other. If you did one over here, and this this setup over here would be a mirror image of of the left side. But uh, to your point about uh, since my board was only three tails wide, um, these these other fingers don't get in the way at all. They actually help because they do they Helps. do provide support. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm cutting that last tail, you know I've got. Yeah. What about two and a half inches, three inches of, of router base out here in in midair? Unless I have, unless unless it's sitting on something. So, um, yeah, I would I would want to have. This this is actually beneficial, for support of the router base to help keep it level as you're cutting. If you were cutting through dovetails on that machine, uh -huh. would you use the same procedure, or is there something else that you'd have to do, a, a different setup? Well, you, for through dovetails, which I have not done in this jig, okay. I, I want to be honest and saying right up front, Joe, and maybe uh, somebody who has can answer the question better than I, but you use two different bits and you use uh, different scales. Uh, the scales that you need are, are on the jig as well. Uh, and the, the route, the, the bits you need are, are in this box. So in other words, you use a, a dovetail cutter with an angle and, and also use a, a, a straight cut bit as well. But uh, other than that, other than setting the scales and, uh, and uh, changing the router bit between tails and fins, mm -hmm. it's pretty much the same. Yeah. But I, I have not learned the intricacies of how to set the scales yet to accomplish that. So um, now looking at number four, half, half blind dovetail cutter details. I referenced earlier the fact that only the 7 16 outside diameter guide bush and one of five cutters shown here may be used. The lesser the angle, the deeper the potential cut, the greater the angle, the shallower the cut. And the, the angle really doesn't have anything to do with how deep you can go other than the fact that they manufacture the cutters at a shallower angle the taller they are. In other words, the, the right. potential cutting depth uh, is greater with the shallower angle bits or cutters. There's not a single reference to bit in the, in the Lee, hmm. Lee manual. They refer to dovetail cutters. So. I try to use the term dovetail cutter when I'm talking about the jig. But uh, what we have in there, as uh, 
as Kevin asked earlier, is number 120, which is the second, well, we have it on the screen, second from the left there is the cutter that's in there. And uh, if you're not familiar with uh, eight millimeter shank bits, uh, these Canadian bits that come with the jig, you can tell from where you're sitting, that's not a quarter inch and that's not a half inch. That's eight, eight millimeter. Yeah. So if all you have is a um, one half inch collet, then you'll need to use this spacer. So this would go in, in there. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Am I there? Sort of. Yeah. Uh, this spacer would go in the, eight, the half inch collet and then the, the bit fits into the spacer. John? Yeah. Kevin? Mike? Will, um, will that bit work in, if you've got a quarter inch collet? Or do you have? No. And it won't work in a half inch either. You've got to use the spacer either way? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the the bit my my only dovetail bit is is the same number one twenty with a half inch shank, I, I'm sorry a quarter inch shank, so uh, then you can use the the quarter inch. I mean the, this is not the only size that the bits come in obviously shank wise, you can you can get uh, quarter inch uh, as well as the. I haven't I haven't seen do they do these come in uh, half inch Does anybody know? Yeah. Yeah. Really close to five sixteen. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. The the eight eight millimeter. Yeah. 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 Three three fifteen. Oh, is it? Three twelve. Okay. Thank you. All right. So. Question. Yeah. Robert. If your width of your board is this on? Yes. Yeah. If the width of your board is four inches or five inches or six inches, how do you make the cut symmetrical among the, the, along the whole board? Good question, and that's what we're gonna cover when we go through the specifics of the setup here. Okay, so I think we're uh, now into the detail that we, what I just accomplished um, and did without a lot of explanation in, in doing that one joint, we're going to kind of mess things up here and, uh, and, and go through this process in order to recreate what we ended up with before we did that, that, those cuts, okay? So what I'm saying is we're going to take off the finger assembly. But before we do that, we're going to take our lead jig I mean, my Lee screwdriver, I meant to say. Flip it over again to the tail side. And what we would do, well, we'll, we'll cover that momentarily, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna loosen the fingers and they just slide out of the way. And this nasty note that Dave, David wrote on the machine doing an auto over tighten fingers just snug, he's referring to the fingers themselves right here. See this, these square drive screws? They are pretty wimpy. And if you over tighten them, you're gonna go, shoot, can't use that finger anymore because you've stripped it out. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just a matter of practice and getting a, getting a feel for it, but um, as I move them and retighten them, then, and I'm going to kind of slide these real quickly out of range here or out of position relative to the board we're going to be cutting. But for the sake of uh, our time limitation here, I'm not, not gonna pull out the 
extrusion material we have in there. We'll just cut the same, same width uh, tails again, tails and pins again, with the with the the same extrusion material in there that we had before. Okay, so now I've loosened those. I'm going to pull the finger assembly off. What I'm trying to accomplish is get back to a state where that you would encounter when you went into that room, grabbed the jig, pulled it out here, and okay, now what do I do? So these steps are, are intended to help us get from nowhere to ready to make beautiful dovetails. <laughs> so uh, second step would be to prepare some, some test boards. These are test boards, that's a test board. Um, and there are various various widths. What I was cutting was five and a half, and these are a bit less than that. So we can use these a different width to set up our new assembly, our finger assembly, so that uh, to your point, it uh, they're aligned correctly for a four-inch board or a five-inch board, or uh, and not they're, they're, you're not locked in. And that's the beauty of the. This joint, in fact, uh, Gary and I were talking before the session about he has a version of this that that uh, is used on a, a router table, um, but there's a lot of jigs that are made that are not variable, like uh, a Porter cable version. You know, it's just one cast piece, and if you don't like that the size uh, fingers and tails that it cuts, then tough. You know, nothing you can do about it. Whereas this one is infinitely variable. Um, and if you think about it, they don't, you know, the, the, the dovetails that you have on, on one side of your drawer don't have to be symmetric, you know, from top to bottom. Uh, they don't have to be the same size at all. You could have, you know, tails closer together up here than you do down below. You could have big tails, you could have in a, in a little tail, because every time you make a change, you're just flipping side to side. And what you did to that tail is going to happen when you cut the pin as well. So it uh, is pretty flexible in that regard. So we're, we're, we'll use, uh, we've got the, our, our test boards prepared. Uh, we're going to clamp the spacer board in the rear speed clamps with the levers pointed down, as I said before, and our, our spacer board was this guy. And put that back in here. And doesn't need to be precisely positioned at all. I should be able to, see now that's too tight. And you loosen it just by spinning the speed clamp, but I should be able to clamp this with one with the thumb. And this is in the manual too. If you have to all right, everybody stand back, you know, then it's too tight. I should be able to, ooh, just like that. That's plenty tight. I would challenge you to pull that board out of there. It's not going anywhere. But you don't, you, I mean, these are plastic. Uh, you know, they're not indestructible. So make sure you, you, I'm sure your thumbs are stronger than mine in most cases. But that's all you need is, is just that one thumb pressure required. D says, and we're up, up to D there, mount the finger assembly on the support brackets in the HB tail mode, flat on the spacer board. So we're going to, I know we just pulled this off, but we're going to put it right back on as if we had just pulled this out of storage. Set the scales on the thickness uh, to your tailboards always, you know. So tailboard, I know because of milling these boards, it, the thickness is three quarters of an inch. So I'm going to set it at three quarters of an inch using the reference line. There's only one line. You might, if you can, Chris, zero in right here, but. There's one reference line on these support brackets that the finger assembly mounts on, and I shouldn't have racked that the way I did. 
can you see that mark? Yes, yes. That's the mark that you're going to align your three quarter inch scale to. So avoiding parallax at all cost, I'm gonna look straight down on my scale on both ends and set it at three quarters of an inch. And there is a little gap between the scale, the scale uh, sighting device and the and the mark on the on the support bracket. So you got to make sure that you are looking straight down on it, or you're gonna you're gonna be out of whack. Then you're gonna move the outermost guide finger on each side out to touch the scales and tighten. These two guide fingers are used to only to support the router. And again, repeating myself as I will innumerable t times more, that would be this guide finger and this guide finger on this end. You want them positioned only, as we talked about before with the extra fingers in the center here, uh, we want them to uh, be there to support the router base as we get, you know, as we're over on that side of the jig making our cuts. So, um, then we're going to mark a line on the inside of the tailboard at the desired cutter depth using your square. So I pulled this out of the uh, cabinet in there since my square is locked in the toolbox. And uh, I already cheated in using the square at 7 sixteenths. I made that, that line on my tailboard there, okay? So... I could have done this a long time ago, but my pin stop board I'm pulling out. And this is going to this is going to be my new, new tail board. Yes. And uh, now I'm going to clamp this tail board in the left front speed clamp with the lever pointing down against the side stop with the top edge flush under the guide fingers and the inside face towards you. So in order to do that, I need to lower my guide fingers to where they need to be. Oops, and I, you know, see I did that without thinking. I loosened the, the scale thumb screws and not the locking knob on the locking knob on the finger assembly. So I'm gonna bring that down. And I'm gonna take my tailboard again with my line on it. And I'm gonna bring it up through the front clamps, and I'm against the side guide. Can you see that side stop over there? Mm -hmm. So that's where the board is referenced laterally. And then vertically, it's it's coming up and touching the underside of my my uh, pins. Or, I'm sorry, my fingers. So one thumb pressure clamps that in place, and I'm going to. Then raise my finger assembly slightly again and start adjusting these. And I'm just going to eyeball these. I could use, as indicated here, um, let's see, oh, the next step would be to adjust the right speed clamp at the free end to bow about an eighth, eighth of an inch from Titan. So you're not, you don't put a spacer board, you don't put a spacer board in here for this front clamp, what you do is you adjust the clamp pressure so that when you're tight over here on the left, you're about an eighth of an inch further in. Believe it or not, you want that you want the clamp clamping bar to, to bow on this right end. So I've they're both clamp the clamp pressure is on, um, but this one's a lot tighter because there's nothing there to clamp. So I want I want that bowed pressure. Hey Joe. John, uh -huh. those. Uh your your pin guides, yeah, are they hooked together, um, or are they are those two little things separate? They look like they're you're sliding them at the same time. Are you talking about these, yes, those these things right there? Two? Are they hooked together somehow? No, they're separate. They're if separate. I pu if I pull out the extrusion, okay, then they move separately. Okay. No, I'm cheating by having the extrusion in place, and as I as I stated. We're just going to leave leave the pins the same size or the tails and pins the same size by by just sliding them uh, with the with the extrusion in place. So that's why I'm moving them in pairs. Okay, so 
Now what I'm going to do is um, I'll make sure I'm not skipping any steps. And this, again, this is distilled from a whole bunch of pages in the manual. Um, unclamp, I'm on J now, 5J. Unclamp and raise the finger assembly about a sixteenth of an inch above, above the board. I did that. Uh, raise and lower finger assembly simultaneously and evenly, never one end at a time, so uh, as damage to the jig may occur, which we already talked about as well. Uh, K, ignoring the extreme left hand guide finger next to the scale, loosen enough adjacent guide fingers to achieve the desired tail layout. Adjust the guide fingers by eye, by measuring, or through the use of setup bars. So if I had my setup bars, I could show you that I used a 5 16 inch setup bar for this pattern, the previous pattern I had, and uh, between, the, uh, between the pairs of fingers, and I used a, a half inch in the space between to create the size of the tail I wanted. I think this was a half an inch, and then the space between the, the pairs of fingers was 5 16 using setup bars, but I'm just gonna eyeball it. So now I'm gonna bring this over and just, we talk about racking a lot, but if you try to push the front of the pin or the rear of the pin, it's gonna rack and not go anywhere. So tr try to push them in the middle, okay? And so I'm holding on and pushing them in the middle, and I'm gonna leave about a half a pin. Typically, you know, traditionally, you'd see a half a pin top and bottom of, of your, your, your tail, the side of the drawer with the tails. Uh, you would have a half a pin at the top and the bottom. Let's see how these fit if I just kind of slide these three in position again. They're a little bit stubborn. That doesn't look too bad. And then um, again, I'm just eyeballing. How's that look? Pretty good? Yeah. All right. So with that accomplished, I'm gonna grab my square drive screwdriver again and snug these down. Okay. Move the fingers by pushing on their middle. Use the bridge ext extrusion material. This is when, you know, typically you would have made those adjustments. Well, I, I, I kind of think I know how wide I want my tails to be, but I haven't, you know, I'd, I'd get this adjusted here without the extrusion in place. Um, and then, then I'd go cut my extrusion chunks that I would stick in there. And then after positioning as desired, now I have my, uh, use the bridge extrusion material to fit into the ends of the guide finger tails if the gaps are wider than an eighth of an inch. M, it says, after positioning as desired, Tighten all guide fingers. Do not over tighten. So that's, we've accomplished that. These are all, all tight, ready to go. Replace the spacer board with the end grain of a horizontal backing board pushed flush against the back of the test tail board. This board can be used for successive cuts. And we already used it once for the, the board we already, board, the joint we already cut. But see how I've cut into that already? Guess what? Now I'm going to take out the spacer board, put this back in. We can use it again and again and again because those those uh, tails are going to be cut in. Well, you know what? It may not work quite well enough, so I'm going to spin this around and use the other end because I, I did readjust everything, didn't I? Mm -hmm. But typically, if you... Uh, or making the uh, same, same cutting boards with the same pattern each time. You can just use that same board over and over again. Okay, so thumb pressure, I'm back down. And over here, uh, I'm going to uh, use that same rule of about an eighth of an inch bow. 
and I can't really tell from where I am whether that's about right, so I'm going to go a little bit more. It's not going to do any damage to this uh, aluminum, but that's plenty tight again, so we're pretty much ready. So we're going to lower the finger assembly. Lower the O five O says lower the finger assembly onto the backing backing board, and test the uh, tail board, and test tail board. Excuse me, it must touch the test tail board. Otherwise, the depth of cut will vary, and your joints won't fit. So there's little hints, you know, sprinkled throughout here to remind you to make sure that everything is flat level and. where it needs to be. Now again, I'm going to take my right side scrap board, it says right there, right side scrap board, <laughs> and put it back in here. See how, see how much, see I'm trying to fit it in from the front? It won't go in. And that's going to tell you, if I tighten that down right now, my, my finger assembly's taking a nosedive off here to the right, so that's why I'm putting this back in. And by the way, there's a little uh, knurled surface for clamping um, back here, and it's about a 30 second higher than the base that um, that the board you're going to cut is sitting on. So don't don't push it past. See, hear how I'm hitting that that edge there? I just push it back till roughly I'm to that edge, and then I tighten it down. So again, I'm pressing down, give it a little then snug it up as I'm, as I'm pressing down. And I always glance, yep, looks like I'm in contact. <clears throat> I don't see any gaps here, so we're ready to go. Uh, now P, we're going to adjust the cutter height to align the cutter tip with the marked line. So you know, we, uh, we could have cheated and, well, I'm, I'm not going to cheat. We're going to move this guy. We can unplug it to be safe. And now we've, now we set our router up here. And we're gonna go down here and, and then adjust the height. So it's the tip of the cutter is aligned with the line that we had indicating the depth of cut we wanted our tails to have. Okay, so now I've accomplished that, and I'm not yet going to plug that back in. Okay, lower, uh, adjust the cutter height to align the cutter tip with your mark line for the first light cut. And I didn't explain this when I made my cuts before, but turn on the router and move the move right to left with only the tip of the the cutter cutting, which leaves a very clean shoulder in the side grain. So if you think about the fact that the, the cutter is spinning, is revolving this way, if I tried to do the bulk of my cutting from right to left, uh, I'm gonna, that's gonna result in a clam cut, which is gonna slam that baby into something here. I don't know what it is, but what you wanna do is just initialize your routing with with a right to left cut, because that gives you a cleaner cut for the shoulder. The shoulder is right there, okay? That line all the way across. So I'm gonna initialize that line with one right to left cut, just with the tip, just cutting into my wood, okay? And then once, I, once I've established that, then I'm gonna start back on this side, and I, this is backwards compared, compared to the, the jig, but then I'll start routing the tails from left to right. So initially cut a line for the shoulder. Wow, that's a nice clean line, right to left, and then do the, the majority of your cutting left to right, okay? And with, uh, with the left to right cuts, as I'm sure you heard when I did it before, it's I'm taking bites at a time. You're not gonna drive all the way, uh, you know, to cut your, the full depth of your of your tail, 
in one pass. You're going to do that in successive passes, as indicated here. Uh, it says uh, do your um, first light cut, turn the router on, and move right to left with only the tip of the cutter cutting, which leaves a very clean shoulder in the side grain. And then R says next, route in and out from left to right, following the guide fingers to route out each pin socket in three to five passes, leaving the tails. And then we're going to remove the test board. So let's do that again. And uh, again, we're repeating what we did before, but with more detail and explanation. Okay. Cutting that last tail, I was catching. <laughs> here's a here's a good uh, explanation of my failure to, or good illustration of my failure to follow the instructions. I did not tighten down these fingers that I had moved out of the way, and. As a result, one of them had, was canted up just a bit. So as I was trying to round this, the corner on this last tail, it was catching the edge of that finger and preventing me from completing that cut without, without having to raise the uh, router base just a bit to get around that corner. So yeah, these, these were still loose and that was my fault. You should make sure that all your fingers are tight before you start any cut. Okay. So there's our new tailboard. Okay. I'm literally going to put these on the ground because I am easily distracted when not distracted, but don't want to mix them up. Okay. So, Continuing with the process, remove the tailboard is S, T is clamp a scrap board in the front clamp so that its top edge projects above the face of the jig's horizontal bed by about an eighth of an inch. This is what we did before. This is pin stop board. So that's going in the front clamp. It's coming up. And I'm gonna land it right about there. So it's in place. Uh, remove the backer, backing board. And to do that, I really should raise the, I'm raising my finger assembly about that 16th of an inch just so I can slide things in and out more easily. Put this down. 
take out my backing board. And then I'm going to place a V is place a test pin board in the left rear horizontal clamp against the side stop uh, with the front edge flush against the vertical scrap piece inside face up. So I'm going to say that this guy is the same width. Let's make sure it's the same width as the tails I already cut. Yep. Okay, so this is going to be my pin board, and we're going to say that's the inside of the pin board. So I'm going to come in, and I'm butting it against the uh, the pin pin stop board here, and again clamp it in place. A lot of times you only need to if you're working over here on the side of the machine, you only have, need to release these. The clamps on that side, you probably noticed I did, I typically, not uh, consistently, but typically uh, didn't unclamp the right side. <clears throat> so we got the test board in place. Now we're going to uh, follow the instruction in 5W, ro rotate the finger assembly 180 degrees, flip front to back to HP pin mode, then set the scale to the tailboard thickness same setting as tails. Uh, both HB pin and HB tails are always set to the tail thickness, tail board thickness. Okay, so I'm going to loosen these thumb screws again. Flip it over. And now this time I'm going to set it at three quarters. Before I set it at 13 16 because I, I knew how it, those test boards fit together. We're going to pretend I don't have that experience, so I'm going to set this at three quarters and three quarters. Then set the scale uh, to your tailboard thickness. We already did that. Now X says ensure the finger assembly is flush and level on top of the test pin board. The finger assembly can be leveled by placing a board of the same thickness under the other end of this finger assembly, but not under the rear clamp. So we're going to repeat what we did previously. And that's my tail backing board. This is my right scrap board. So I'm going to put it in here. And again, I'm going to I'm clamped in at three quarters and I'm going to lower my finger assembly with these locking knobs. Push down, lock, push down, lock. And then we're going to route our pins. Y, route out waste between pins left to right in three passes. If the cutter inadvertently enters the right side of an opening, it will result in a climb cut, a very strong and violent pull to the left. So that's what we were talking about before. So you're always going to go left to right. Okay, so before I do that, I'll check my clamps. Two pairs of clamps, thumb screws tight, locking knobs tight. Glance at my pin board and the finger assembly is, is flush on the top there. So I'm ready to go. So I'm going to route the pins at this point.
Okay. Remove the test pin board and test for fit with the tailboard. If the fit needs adjusting, we'll do what's indicated there, but let's take it out and see what happens. And if it fits, I'm going to be amazed. I don't think it will. No. But this, I mean, this would be typically your first try. And I was, I was not trying to cheat at all by knowing what I think the, uh, the final, I want to start with Ace here and we'll go that way. What needs to be changed? That's what we're going to talk about right now. So, if you look at Z, remove the test pin board and test for fit. If the fit needs adjusting, decreasing the cutter depth, and this is critical, decreasing the cutter depth, that is raising the cutter in the router, results in a looser fit because the width of the pin will decrease while the width of the pin socket remains the same. We need a looser fit, so <clears throat> I made this illustration. I th this is a critical point. This is the this is the the uh, router cutter, world's largest router cutter. Okay, and this is our the the uh, pin board that we just cut. Okay. Flip it over to this one. You're getting a black backdrop. Okay. There you go. What if I put it on the tape? Well. That works right there. You're lined up with. Right here. Yeah, you're good there. Okay. All right. So, if you can envision what's happening here. Um, we're too tight. So if I raise the cutter, look what happens. These are the pins. Pin, pin. If I raise the cutter, look what happens to the width of the pin. It decreases, okay? But this same cutter, when it's, when it's cutting the tails, uh, it's gone up and down, but the tail socket is still the same orientation. It hasn't got wider because it's just going up and down. But when when the cutter comes up, it makes the pins in the pin board narrower for a looser fit. Does that make sense? Raise the cutter, loosens the cut. If I lower the cutter, then it's gonna make the pins wider. You see how that would work? And I I think this is a pretty good illustration. Um, obviously, this cutter is not going to be just the width of the tail socket because you're, you know, you're 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 cutting a broader dimension, if you will. But but for illustration purposes, it it still works. If this comes up, the pins get smaller. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to decrease the width of the decrease the the depth of cutter. I'm going to unplug my router. I'm going to turn it off or turn it upside down. I'm going to take my my uh, caliper and see where I'm at. I don't know whether this is viewable, Chris, but pardon? Uh, that's that's showing 0.89 inches. Okay. And, and I'm measuring from the, the tip of the, the cutter tip to the base of the guide bush, eight, nine inches. Let me check, double check it on this side too. That's showing 91, or 90, excuse me. A hundredth of an inch difference. Why is that? No, that's 92. Okay. So, decreasing the cutter depth, raising the cutter in the router results in a looser fit. So, I want to lower the base, which is going to lessen the height of the of the of the cutter. 
And I'm going to I'm going to guess that that's going to be accomplished with about a fifteen thousandth change. Or since this only measures in hundredths of an inch, we're going to go to instead of being 0.9, we'll go to uh, 0.88 and see what that does. So I'm going to loosen the collar. Raise my base until I get to about 88. And I'm going in the wrong direction so far. That's a really nice caliper knot. That's 85. I went a little too far. 89. Oops. And I'm not real. Why is that thing not going down? Is there a lock on this I don't know about? You need extra hand. Huh? You need extra hand. There we go. That's way too low. Eighty nine. Boy, this thing is really a piece of junk. 86. Tell you what, we're going to... Yeah, I think that's going to be too much. Eighty-nine. I'm sorry. Eighty-eight. Nobody breathe. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So now, unfortunately, we need to repeat the process. Yeah, you want to you want to chop those off for me, George? That would be wonderful. Can you take these two? Why don't we do them all? Even if, uh, don't worry, we're not going to try to dial this into the nth degree. If, if, if this doesn't fail, if this doesn't fit, I mean, I think it'll illustrate what we're trying to do. We may have actually overshot it, who knows. But uh, this will show you the, the theory of, of making the pins narrower is going to loosen the fit. While he's doing that, I'll flip the finger assembly back over for tails.
not yeah. anything on the jig. Yeah, the question was whether anything else changes other than the depth, the cutter projection, and the answer is no. I've set this at, at three quarters again, just as I did with the first attempt. So, you know, I'm not saying this isn't a fiddly process. Uh, it, it does take some monkeying like we're doing, but at the same time, once you get them uh, dialed in like that first cut I made, I, I, I knew we were there and it, it worked fine. And that can happen consistently once you, uh, once you do get it dialed in. So, um, for our tailboard again, thank you, George. We're gonna put our spacer board in there for a minute. And then we're going to uh, put our tailboard in again. Well, let's lower the finger assembly, excuse me. Need to lower the finger assembly so that you adjust the, or you get the tailboard positioned flush under the guide fingers. That looks good. Then we're going to raise it again. So I got the tailboard in there. We're just going through the same process again. We'll pull the spacer board out. I'm going to put the uh, tail backing board in here. Clamp it down. I'm going to put my right side spacing board in here. I'm going to lower my finger assembly. And what have I forgotten? Okay. So now we're ready to cut our fingers again. Check my speed clamps, speed clamps, thumb screws, and locking knobs. We're ready to go. There's our new tail board. I'll raise my finger assembly.
Okay. That's going to be our new pin board, and we're going to use our pin stop board to position it. So we put it in just a bit higher than the, the bed that the pin board's sitting on. Position it. Clamp down our new pin board. Put my right side scrap board back in. Lower the finger assembly. Oh. You guys were supposed to supposed to remind me that I didn't flip the uh, finger well, assembly over. I was going to, but <laughs> I thought I'd wait just to make sure that you weren't going to. So. The finger assembly off. Flipping it over. I don't think one, one thing I have not mentioned at all is the actionable scale is always on the right side as you're looking at it. You're never going to be reading. Everything on the left side is upside down. The actionable scale, see the green scale there that I'm pointing at? It's on the right side on both sides of the, uh, both sides of the finger assembly. Okay, so I'm setting it again at three quarters, three quarters, lower my finger assembly, put my right side spacer bar or uh, scrap board back in, And I'm ready to go. Clamps, clamps, thumb screws, lucky knobs. Okay. These dog holes in the table make a nice yeah. <laughs> recess for the uh, router bit. Okay. Everybody saying a little prayer again? <laughs> Not really. Like I say, we won't go through this again yet. I mean, you, this explains the process anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we went too far. Okay, so now it's too loose. And what we would do at this juncture, you can pass this around, is 
we overshot it, you would you would lower the bit by the by the gap that you see there. You see that amount. So you'd go back to that. So twenty thousandths was definitely too far. The other th situation we have that, that I'll I'll jump to right now is is the depth of the the tails in in the in the pin board. You see how it's proud of that. Yeah. By I'm going to guesstimate based on my calibrated eyeballs, uh, most of a sixteenth of an inch. Okay, so that is accomplished by <clears throat> we can recut just the pin board in the interest of time uh, and we're going to make an adjustment to our scales and this this is only done to the pin board not to the uh, tail board we're going to move the finger assembly away from us which is going to allow the router cutter to go in deeper which is going to bury those tails farther into the into the pin board. Okay, so I'm at three quarters here, and I can do this without rerouting the tail board. Okay, it's it's still going to be wrong, but uh, when I when I th with this new set of pins, that should be more flush. But it it still won't fit. We'll still have that gap because we would need to change our router cutter depth in order to to overcome that problem. So I'm going to change this to 13 sixteenths. Lower my finger assembly. And first of all, clamp the pin board in place. Lower that, lower that, check, 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 ready to go. John, do you want to put your spacer in on the right or, or is it in? Pardon? It's in. Oh, it is in. It's in. Okay, so we jump to 5BB with proper joint tightness, check for flushness. The tails should be slightly up to a 64th deeper than the pins. <clears throat> if, the, if the tails are proud, which they were, adjust only the HB pin scale away from the operator by the same amount that it was proud. And that's what we just accomplished. Conversely, we'd move it, if, the, if they were too deep already, we'd move it back towards us. Okay, so let's check and see if we did any, anything constructive with that. Raise finger assembly. 
unclamp my pin board. Try again. And how about that? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. it came out. And it, I mean, it didn't do anything in terms of of the fact that we lowered our, our cutter yeah. too much with that first adjustment, but it did bring us back to... to um, okay, let's say that this joint did fit the way we wanted it to. Oh my gosh, that's nice and tight and and flush. Then the last step would simply be to don't lose this information, you know, and, and by that I mean record the cutter number, record the cutter projection, that 0.88 inches that I was talking about. Uh, you'd want to write that down, write down the tail setting, the three quarters, which is always your, your tail board thickness, and then the pin, pin setting, which could be different from the sail, ta tail setting because of what we just encountered, and that was the, uh, the difference in fl flushness. So we, we changed that from three quarters to 13 sixteenths. And uh, then you're ready to go with the same setup in the future. And then if you, I mean, if you change your, your uh, finger assembly arrangement a little bit, you know, they were not quite the same dimension, who cares? Those, those dimensions will all still work, yeah. even though your fingers are totally different sizes. You could go from five fingers to three, and it'd be, be, still have the same situation. Um, I wanted to mention that, and, and that's it, that's it. We're, uh, we are concluded, but how about that? Perfect. One minute. Um, I put my phone number and email address on here, and I would be more than happy to come in and work one-on-one. -on -one. If you had a, a, a project that you would like to um, do half-line dovetails on, give me a shout. I'm retired. I have time and would be delighted to come in and, and work with, with one, anyone in that regard. Or I've even got a little bit of time this afternoon if anybody wants to give it a shot right now before we tear it all down and put it away. John, I'm ready to go production. You've got a joint there that fits up. I like that. Now what I want to do is, is do I take the right side and set it up for the right side of the drawer you would, and you, the left side? and set it up for the left side of the drawer. So Are you when do I do my pin, mm -hmm. I do both sides instead of clamping everything well, in. Well, are, are, the, are the sides of your drawers? All my drawers are are one inch high. But <laughs> it, is, is this pin pattern, pin tail pattern uh, symmetrical? I don't, I, don't, I don't care about symmetrical? the other side of the drawer. Huh? I don't care about the other side of the drawer. Yeah. I just want if, I want it so that you see the, the the pins and tails on the one side and you see the pins and tails on the other side. Independent. And they're the of, same number, yeah. but they're not necessarily in the exact same yeah. position. Um, if 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 that pattern was symmetrical, you'd cut every joint right here on the left side. If you were doing an asymmetric pattern where you wanted the top of the the front of the drawer taller than the sides of the drawer then you would set up a mirror image pattern over here relative to the pattern on this side okay and then then you'd cut all your all all your left hand joints over here and then when you're done with that then you'd come over and cut all your right hand joints okay Ace? So all, yeah, all of your, so you, you know, for, I think for me, I can speak for myself, there, there, I'm going to have two, maybe three different, you know, for for half inch, for, for three quarter inch, for, you know, wide, more widely spaced, for more narrowly spaced. My guess, is there not already kind of a pre, preset settings, or, or not preset, these recordings at the end here at, at CC, 
keep uh, record the all these stuff. Are those? It's kind of kind of like what we have here for the um, laser engraver. We have you know pre people have put down well what what works for this kind of wood. You know how many? What's the wattage? What's the speed? Do we not already have that for this a kind of a logs for what people have used so that we don't have to figure it out? It's a good time. question. Uh, different combinations of, of uh, kind of, pre <coughs> kind of preset. Different combinations of, yeah. of drawer front and drawer yeah. side widths. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no, we don't. Uh, and oh, by the way, as we were setting <coughs> the scales to the to the pin, excuse me, to the tail board thickness, which is the side of the drawer, Th this could have been oh, half inch, yeah. five eighths, yeah. anything, you know, uh, going into this three quarter inch thick yeah. drawer front. Um, this, this, if you, if you, you know, it, it's easy to see why, it's not easy to take them apart all the time, but it's easy to see why this, this thickness is the critical one, because Look at where that, I mean, that's gobbling up that whole, the whole width of that board. And if your board's only a half an inch thick, then you, you want these tails to be cut only a half an inch deep as well. Um, whereas this guy, you know, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of variability there. This, this could have been five eighths of an inch thick and it wouldn't have mattered at all. See how much meat we still have left there. And you know, a lot of people like like the, the, uh, their dovetail to come a lot deeper into the board than this does. But, uh, but no, I don't, think there, I don't think there are existing settings. I mean, it would be uh, a matter of trial and error. Um, but I mean, would that be a useful enhancement to this setup to, to start a, a, li a little log book that would, that would show that, yeah. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of variables. Well, no, you could even record the, the cutter projection, uh, assuming that you're using, you know, the 120, yeah. the 120 uh, cutter, et cetera, et cetera. I'll mention too that speaking of the cutter selection, three of the five sizes that are shown in the illustration here are in this box. And I, I just verified that through inspection the other day. There's a, that's the number uh, 128. And then there's also the biggest one right there. That's the, uh, the number 80. So if you wanted to do some monster or you had some really thick stuff, that, that would be the, the uh, cutter that you'd want to use for for that joint too, or for a larger joint than what we did today. Other questions? What keeps the router from going in that space? I guess that little cutout thing keeps the router from going in. Yeah, the, the extrusion, when you're cutting the tails, that extrusion piece, okay. um, is preventing the router from diving into in, into that opening, which you know in the case in the case of of the setup that we di we well, tested yeah. today, um, see the see the gap where that extrusion material is. That looks to me to be right at. What about right here? What um, the router from going in there? Well, that's that's not critical at all, Robert. If you think about it, because the board is only, in our case, was three quarters of an inch thick. So once I got into this, I never got that deep. Where was my backing board? See, there's my backing board. That's all the beyond the three quarters. That's all the deeper I was going into into this material. Okay, so yeah, it was. That board was sitting about right there, if you can see that, and this opening was, gosh, at least a, a whole half inch deeper. But I mean, it, that begs a good question: how deep, you know, how how thick could your, how deep could your tails be, 
Um, there's the answer right there. That's that's the depth that this that the, that this system accommodates. Anything else? Like I say, give me a call. Send me an email, and I can I can meet with you and uh, and uh, have some fun. It is. I mean, once you get it set up, it goes like lickety split. How long did it take to cut one of those boards? Other than all my gabbing, I mean, it was two minutes, maybe. How long would it take you to cut those by hand, Wayne? <laughs> yeah. Long got a lot of them to do. Yeah, if you got a lot of them to do, you, you would have to augment the, the, your productivity somehow. You know, I, I think this is a good, good way. I'm holding on to a bracket here. You might wonder what the heck this is for. Um, Craig says it works, Craig Arnold. I can't make, it's, it's a vacuum uh, device. I should have brought it out just to show it to you. If anybody figures out how to use it effectively, let me know, because I'd like to know. But look, I'm a mess, the floor is a mess, and what it is, is it, it, it's a track with a, with a slidable nozzle, and you hook up a, a vacuum hose to it, and mm -hmm. it, yeah. it, it, uh, it supposedly evacuates the chips as, as you go. But, oh my gosh, I, uh, I found it to be extremely cumbersome. It gets half. Huh? It gets half in the... It does? Half. Yeah, and that probably... <laughs> I found it really distracting and, you know, hard to work. Oh, I mean, because the thing's literally right here in your face. And it's sit sitting in there. They also say if you want to play with it. For newbies, it will help so you don't rock the, the router back for you. Balance that, that oh, is that right? Too. Yeah, okay. The router back in balance the board or something like that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's good to know. I didn't find any use for it, but but uh, I didn't I didn't give it a a fighting <laughs> chance either. I didn't work with it for very long. I said abandon ship. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I put it back on the shelf. Thank you, John. You're very welcome. Be sure to join us next month for Ball and Claw Feet with Calvin Hobbs. All right. All right. Thank you. This has been a production of the Kansas City Woodworkers Guild. A special thank you to our guest today, to the Guild's Leadership Committee, and to all of our sponsors. For more information about the Guild, upcoming classes, and events, please visit our website kcwg.org. You can also find us on social media by searching for Kansas City Woodworkers Guild. If you like this video, please be sure to like, comment and subscribe. For more videos, please check out our YouTube channel.